What's up, Internet? Welcome to another IT Pro Show that'll keep you in the know. I'm Jeff Gretler, and today we're going to be talking about all about Azure, because guess what? It's 2022. We're in the future. So our friends at Trusted Tech Team and Spiceworks at Davis are going to tell you all about Azure in 2022, how to cut those costs, how to boost your security, and how to maximize your flexibility. So as we all know, the Trusted Tech Team have MVPs that are gonna get you through everything you need to know about Azure today. So we're gonna bring them in, and we're gonna be fair about this. We're gonna bring them in in alphabetical order, because how fair does it get from there? So our first MVP, batting first, he is an Azure architect from professional services. Please welcome Blake Wilson. Blake, what's up, man? I am doing pretty good, how about yourself? Good, good to see you, good to see you. How was your uh, summer? It's fall already, I can't believe that. How was your summer? Uh, it's it's not fall here in California yet. It's still summer. It's <laughs> still hot. Uh, <laughs> I'll, it I'll have fall like in about three months. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Do you have one memory that you have for summer that you want to share with everyone? Your best memory uh, for 2022? So for the long weekend the other day, uh, we went golfing out in Palm Springs and it was like 105 and we're just dying, but we like make it through the golf course and then everyone just like goes back to the hotel room and just passes out and it's like, oh God, <laughs> going to Palm Springs in the middle of summer, not the greatest idea. <laughs> <laughs> but it led to one of my favorite things, naps. <laughs> yes. oh, so a good, a good post sun nap is perfect. Yeah, it is perfect. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, well, thanks, Blake. So our other MVP is a technical account manager, sales engineer from the Trusted Tech team. Please welcome Chad Seymour. Chad, what's up? Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Good. Good to see you again. How was your summer? You got a memory you want to share for your summer? 2022? Yeah, mine's actually, yeah, mine's along the same lines as Blake. Uh, had a bachelor party out in Palm Springs for my brother. He's getting married soon. And, uh, you know, it's it was 122 at, at, at its highest, and uh, we were outside in the pool the entire time. So, no regrets, I'm but done. yeah, it was, it was pulling up with a nap. I guarantee you that story ended with a nap somewhere along the way, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. if we did it right. So that's awesome. All right, guys. So we got a great audience. We already got questions coming in, so let's jump right into it. So, uh, Chad, I think you're going to start off. You're kind of going to give like the overview and the topic of what we're going to be doing today, all about Microsoft Azure in 2022. Yeah, uh, I can take it from here. Um, to get us going, uh, the Trusted Tech Team is a value-added reseller. We're also a cloud solutions provider, and we do managed services. Uh, and it's pretty much everything from you know, Microsoft on-prem to in the cloud that's in our wheelhouse. Um, our core tenants are simplifying licensing, billing, and technical support for our customers. And by focusing on these three pillars, we offer our customers a unique solution uh, and expertise ranging across the entire Microsoft ecosystem. Time and again, we encounter customers who are grappling with the ever-shifting targets of license administration, billing management, and technical support. Some of our customers have a solid grasp on what they need, some of them don't, and that's where we like to come in and, and help and pull everything together for them. While most customers don't know where to start um, and get the help that they sorely need, I see that as that's where my value is, is added. Uh, unfortunately, cloud vendors such as Microsoft themselves, uh, everyone knows that they like to complicate their, their product lines, what features you're getting and everything in between. So, you know, it's our job to make that as, as easy as possible for you guys. If anyone uh, has never experienced Microsoft giving them a headache, then I would say you're in a very unique position in the industry. <laughs> right, correct. I, I like to think that that's where we get to step in as a partner. Um, we try to alleviate the headaches, make your lives a little bit easier, try and make anything that's complicated a little less complicated. Um, and at the same time, we try and do it for the, you know, the, the benefit of you and ourselves. Uh, we always strive to keep our, you know, our idea that we can save you guys money while giving you a better service and giving you a better product, um, you know, and we look forward to working with anyone that's in the audience, um, navigating whether or not it's a complex case in Azure or just Office 365 licensing. And then um, from here, I do want to lead it into Blake. <laughs> Yeah, of course. So uh, I'm an Azure architect, and so I deal with infrastructure. That's 
a lot of what I deal with. And Azure is the back end of Microsoft's. It is their cloud. It is their infrastructure in the cloud. And uh, whenever you're specking out for infrastructure, one of the biggest decision makers is usually cost. And uh, Microsoft has you know, positioned themselves as one of actually the lowest uh, major cloud providers. And you know, I know what you're thinking. You've you're either in Azure and you're saying this isn't cheap, or you are specking it out and you're seeing those prices and you're like, oh, that's kind of expensive. But by default, a lot of the things that you set up or when you are using a lot of the calculators that have, they do a um, pay-as-you-go model, which is actually really nice for certain things. Uh, I love using it to spin up a virtual machine for a demo for an hour, and then I'm only paying for that one hour that it's active. But as you know, whenever anything is on demand like that, it's usually not the cheapest. So one of the things that really helps you cut cost, and this is the biggest cost savings that you can find for uh, you know, saving your money on your infrastructure is uh, Azure has what they call reserved instances, which is kind of very similar to how on-prem works, right? You buy your equipment on-prem and you expense it out throughout its life cycle, whether it's you know one year, three years, five years. Uh, Azure does it very similarly where you can reserve your compute cost and say, oh, I'm going to use this virtual machine for one year or for three years, and you get heavy, heavy discounts. They say that you can get up to 72% uh, reduced cost on your compute by doing these reserved instances. And that right there, if you're saving 72%, like you're doing phenomenal, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But if 72 isn't enough there, you can actually save even more. And it's very similar uh, where with the pay-as-you-go model, uh, Azure provides you with licensing. So you are in compliance with Microsoft all the time, uh, which is really nice and really easy. I love it because you don't have to with any of that it's just built in but if you are uh you know if you're running critical uh 24 7 365 applications that's not always the best case uh you can actually do what they call uh, azure hybrid benefit where you bring your own license essentially and it's really nice for if you are on-prem because you can actually migrate those licenses that you already have into Azure and you know, not pay anything for licensing. They're not paying anything additional for licensing, I should say. Or if you are running something that is always on, um, you can save up to 8% is what uh, Microsoft says uh, by using your own licensing because in the pay-as-you-go model, they add that price of licensing in and so you end up kind of overpaying but those are just two little things where you know if you're running infrastructure 24 7 365 which a lot of companies have their critical uh, servers have their critical things that are always running you know just like how you would have your on-prem environment you're going to have things that you can say oh i need this for a year or I need it for three years. And so you can cut it by about 80% is what Microsoft, uh, you know, is their price range. Um, so those are two really great tools. And uh, in the show notes, I have a link for it is for the um, price calculator. And you can actually spec out all of these things. And they have the a little toggle for pay as you go, one year licensing or one year um reservation, three-year reservation, or for the uh, hybrid benefit to bring your own licensing. So you can really go and play around with those and see where you can cut costs and where you can save. And uh, if you are in Azure already, I highly suggest checking out what your payment model is and seeing what do I have pay as I go? Like, what can you find? Oh, this is a critical thing. I need it. I'm going to need it for the next year. Heck, even if you just need it for the next six months, it might actually be beneficial to do a reserved instance even for the year because that compute is always you know, reserved for you and you can always use that compute for something else. And one of my favorite things that is so different from like traditional on-prem is when with traditional on-prem, you have to spec out your hardware for everything, right? And so you're locked into really expensive costs, but you can be very flexible with Azure and you can, do an adjustment and you can say, oh, these are critical applications. I'm going to reserve instance for these. And then I have some other things that are 
you know, maybe I turn them on once a month, once a week for, you know, a, a process here and there, and I use it for a few hours. You can keep those as pay as you go. And that way you can have a lot greater flexibility and you're only paying for what you use on things that aren't, you know, day-to-day -day operations. And then those day-to-day -day operations are getting the best discount that, that, that they can. Um, and then one last note for the people who are on-prem is when you buy hardware, that is the best it's ever going to be, right? You know, it's only going to depreciate until you buy new hardware. With Azure, you can actually update the version of your um, virtual machine hardware. So like I use a lot of V8s in my work. Uh, that's the uh, size of the machine. It's a eight core machine. Um, and then they have version numbers. So it's like a V3. And I think they're a V5 right now. But even when you're in reserved instances, so you're locked in for a year, three years, you if you keep the the actual performance of the machine the same, you can change the version and get go from a V4 to a V5 to make sure you're on the most current um, CPU generation, right? Um, so even if you're locked into your compute cost, you can still get incremental increases. So your experience is never degrading. I mean, you can't do that with traditional on-prem. And if you are already in Azure, I would highly suggest looking at what version all of your uh, virtual machines are using, because to upgrade it, it's it's just a restart. It's really quick. It takes you a minute or two and give you a little bit better experience. And if you're on a really old version and you're doing like a pay-as-you-go model, um, they will start to incentivize the new uh, versions of the machines because they want to get those um, those servers out of their data centers and use that rack space. So they'll actually make the newer generations a little bit cheaper. That way you incentivize you to upgrade and that way they can get rid of that hardware. That's good. Thanks, Blake. That's awesome. I just want to remind her, thank you so much for getting all these questions in. And we're going to have two lucky winners that are going to be getting two $250 e-gift card. So let's keep those questions going because this is a lot of good stuff. Chad, I know you wanted to add some stuff here about landing zones. Yeah, so if anyone's not familiar with landing zones for Azure uh, lately, uh, it's been a, a way for someone who's getting their, their company or their infrastructure moved into Azure for the first time. It's a blueprint that essentially allows you to build out your network architecture, your security, your ID management, and your governance all out of the box. Uh, it allows you to basically customize policies that suit your business uh, and your needs. It allows you to operate within, you know, uh, pre-built guidelines or, or guardrails, as you will, so that you can't really break it. Um, it's it's like a drop, set it, and build it out. And then, um, let's see, for companies that are going into the cloud for the first time, uh, landing zones are going to be uh, super beneficial for you if you're looking to do like something like a traditional lift and shift. Uh, you can kind of simplify the process instead of having to, you know, virtualize every single piece of your infrastructure and move it into the cloud. You can use a blueprint and take what you need, and it's going to let you know specifically what pieces are are uh, important to to migrate from that and what which ones you can leave behind. So there might be you know, cost savings involved with that just from the fact that you can change your infrastructure. Um, and then there's there's different ways to do that too. There's a, a blueprint that's basically gonna let you go one-to-one -one if you do wanna do a traditional lift and shift and then they have a basically a, a flexible future-proof version uh, of the blueprint that you can adapt your policies with. Um, pretty much, we, you know, within those guidelines, there's a lot of benefit in, in yield to get out of the landing zone in the, the cloud uh, Microsoft Azure has. And then um, at Trusted Tech Team, that's kind of our, our bread and butter is if you want to get a landing zone blueprint set up, then we can help you with it. And that's great having you guys. I, I kind of likened it to the hiring a moving company versus moving it yourself. Like, sure, you can do it, but I guarantee you when you hire that moving company, like, wow, you did this so quickly, so efficiently is like, because like people like the trusted tech team that do this every day and you see all different, you're going to get it done quicker and you're going to save yourself a lot of grief going with the uh, experts who've seen all the, a lot of different types of scenarios.
So Blake, what are some of the common use cases that you wanted to go over? Yeah, of course. So there's a lot of things that you can do in Azure. You can kind of do everything that you're doing on-prem and they just work it in differently. Uh, one thing that I love is I love VDI and uh, Azure has uh, Azure Virtual Desktop, which is their VDI application and it replaces uh, traditional terminal servers. And I've actually had two uh, projects this last week where people were on uh, server 2016 as a terminal server. And as we know, uh, 2016 is that end of life. And they're like, oh, we should probably get off this before you know something bad happens, right? End of life is uh, never good. So we were migrating them in. Um, and the new Azure Virtual Desktop with today's environment where we have so many people working remote, it's such a, such a godsend of, you know, you download one app and they have their desktop and they can work completely in it and they're not limited to the compute of whatever device that they have. Um, so it works really great for things like bring your own device. Uh, you know, you can really support any hardware because it's all running, you know, a server that's in Azure. And what's especially nice for like small companies is it lets you, Azure lets you expand outward a lot better because if you have like one location, but you have a bunch of remote workers all over the country, you can stand up uh, virtual machines in different parts of the of the country or even the world and have them connect to those and have the best experience instead of having latency trying to get back to your home office. Um, I had a, an office where we had uh, we had remote workers in India and they were trying to connect back to the US, uh, back to New York, and it was not a good experience. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of things like that where by being in Azure, you get all of the benefits of Microsoft and how big of a company Microsoft and all their resources. And so it lets you really be able to pinpoint where you're putting your resources and help out with that. Um, and just with uh, Azure Virtual Desktop, I've used it a lot to combat uh, data control and compliance issues. Um, you know, That's going back to having, having people in India, we had some compliance issues where we had to maintain all of our data in the States. Um, so by having them remote into a virtual machine um, with Azure Virtual Desktop, they were able to, I was able to say, hey, all of our data is in the US and we were actually able to stand up the virtual machines in India. And so their actual compute was super fast, low latency because they're computing in India, but it's just pinging back to our servers in the US for the actual data. So um, you know, you're able to, you have a lot more flexibility with where things are, what data centers they're in. Because when you're a smaller company, you might have either stuff in your office or in you know, one data center somewhere, you know? Um, yeah, that's great. I, I feel like the, you, like you just hit the nail on the head. There's a lot more black holes and blind spots that we're not used to dealing with now, now that it's 2022 with a completely different working model, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, regulations that you have to like, where is your data house versus where is it computed? So this can make your life a lot easier if you're ever having to deal with any kind of like data compliance and regulations. Yeah, and I'm looking at some of the questions that are coming in. I see one about like um, failover clusters in separate locations. Azure can do all of that. Um, one thing that I that I did for a client recently is they were setting up um, Azure Virtual Desktop and they wanted a failover cluster. So we kind of did very similar to how you'd have like a RAID hard drive where we set up um, virtual machines in all, in a bunch of different locations and then when you would connect, you would connect to any of them. And so if any one site went down, we had other virtual machines elsewhere. And then on top of that, all of those were using the reserved instances. So they were getting really great cost effective. And then we had a few more machines that were turned off on a pay as you go model. So they weren't being charged for them. They'd only get charged for them when we actually spun them up if a site went down. So we would spin up an extra one and we were only paying for the you know, hour or two that, that the Microsoft site was down. So there are a lot of ways that you can utilize uh, all of Microsoft's resources to do failover and disaster recovery um, uh, in, in a much more holistic approach than like a traditional on-prem is gonna ever yeah. allow you to do. Um, awesome. Some other use cases that, uh, you know, kind of that I use a lot is everything in Azure 
and, and kind of Microsoft, you know, is triggering alerts, is making logistical data that you can utilize. So you can, you know, throw all of your information into a lovely dashboard with Power BI. You can analyze trends through metrics. Um, you can use some of the alerts to trigger interactions with logic apps. Um, you know, going back to like the failover, if we could see that one of our machines had went down, we could have that trigger an automatic function to turn on a different machine. That way, you know, we didn't have to do any actual hands-on changes for the failover. Um, so there's a lot of things that you know, in, in a traditional environment, you might be a lot more hands-on. So you get to kind of reduce some of your, uh, you know, my workload as, as a technician, right? Um, there's also a lot of what I like to call serverless functions in Azure, where in a traditional environment, you might have a full server dedicated to like one thing, whether it's like, uh, you know, a SQL database or a file share. Um, you know, or running API web calls, and you might have like a Linux machine for that, and then you have to have a whole Linux uh, admin to man manage just a device that's running API calls or running some code, you know, some automation, things like that. So with a lot of these like serverless functions, Azure actually uh, builds it in so you don't have to maintain the underlying OS and hardware of it. Uh, it. They give it to you in forms of like a logic app or like a storage account. So you only have to maintain that function that you're actually using it for. Um, as you know, so it just, it's little things like that, that really, you know, it's a high use case, but Azure has made it into a low, uh, you know, a low touch environment for the admins. Um, Another thing that we commonly do is, uh, you know, we will take, you know, a lot of your networking stuff and pull it into Azure. So like you can do like firewalls. So Azure has their own firewall. You can do like Defender for, you know, managing machines. You can also run a lot of uh, third party uh, applications. Like you can do a Meraki firewall in Azure and they make it really simple. Um, so those are just some of the many, many use cases. Um, those are literally just some of the projects that I've been working on in the last <laughs> few weeks. <laughs> oh, no, that's awesome. That mean, and you're, again, it's your, I'm sure you're, there's a few people that are getting perfect matches. I'm like, okay, I, I see myself. I can emphasize technical empathy is huge there. So, uh, Chad, why don't you, I, we're already seeing a few questions coming in on this. So you want to hit on, and we'll go over, you know, we're going to do the Q and A probably here in about eight minutes, but do you want to hit on some Azure migrate points? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, Azure migrate kind of goes hand in hand with like landing zones in terms of uh, if you're going to do like a lift and shift, this is kind of Microsoft's tool for you. Um, it's a pretty much its own portal. It's a four-step process. You're basically going to install an agent. It's going to assess your infrastructure. It's going to tell you, you know, what do you have? What can you bring to the cloud? How are you going to bring it to the cloud? Um, you're going to migrate and modernize at that point. Um, that's basically you're going to move everything to the cloud. You're going to get it set up on, you know, the most uh, efficient infrastructure you can. You're going to optimize it. And then the last piece is to secure and manage it. So you're going to lock it down. Uh, you know, set up all your permissions, you're going to set up your, you know, encryption, get your data set up, and then you're going to have all of your monitoring tools for it. Um, I mean, that's pretty much Azure Migrate in a, you know, in a quick little, quick little over, go over. TLDR. All right, cool. Yeah, TLDR. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, guys, uh, one more last point before we get into the Q&A. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the reduction of overhead and the customization and personalization around Azure. Yeah, of course. I was just like reading through all the questions, trying to like think about everything. So I'm gonna actually gonna go slightly out of order because I saw a question that was like, um, how do you look at what is the best way to review all Azure costs? And very there was also another question that was, um, you know, if you're on prem, how do you look at migrating into the cloud? And obviously, you know, you eat an elephant one bite at a time, but the uh, Microsoft actually has this thing called the total cost of ownership calculator. And uh, I think there's a link in the show notes for this as well. And there is, what yeah. it does is you can input all of your compute costs or all of your compute things, like all of your VMs uh, sizing, and they will break it down. It's more of a transitional uh, 
uh, tool where it breaks down what they think, what the average cost of you know doing on-prem hardware is, and then what the Azure cost is going to be. And it's actually really cool because they break out a lot of things that you don't think about in when you're traditionally pricing these things out. Like they and they have kind of uh, you know standard practices. So like one thing is they actually do like electricity costs. And that's something that you don't think about when you're doing like on-prem and you have a server room in, in your, the back of your office. But you know, a few servers add up, you know, a lot of electricity costs very quickly. Um, and you know, that's just kind of included in the price of Azure. Um, or they also do like support costs. You know, I was mentioning about the serverless functions uh, earlier, you know, with, in, in traditional on-prem environments, every of those features, you know, whether it be a file share, whether it be, you know, Active Directory, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, a SQL database, you're maintaining all of those underlying OSs, you know, and the physical hardware and just all of that. There's so much more uh, support costs that you have tied to physical infrastructure and if you have your database somewhere else and you're just running vms in a database or in a data center somewhere else you know and you're paying for those physical machines you're still incurring those costs just differently right um but azure they really uh streamline a lot of things by giving you more tools to do the same things right so you can have like a sql database in a machine in Azure, or you can have like a serverless uh, SQL database in Azure. Um, so once again, the total cost of ownership calculator, you will put in all of your uh, infrastructure and they'll spit out like, oh, this is what we think it would cost to like buy new machines that will do these features. And this is what it's gonna cost for Azure. So I would really suggest if you have an on-prem environment and you're looking to kind of figure that out, check out the uh, total cost of ownership calculator. And then, um, you know, it's it's really nice when you're in Azure because you get to, you get all of that. Like I said, you get all of Microsoft's backing. So you get all of their, uh, their baseline SLAs and like uptime. Like, you know, if you have, if you have, uh, your server room in the back of your office, you have a lot less control over things like power outages and internet outages, whereas Microsoft already has a lot of that redundancy built in. So your baseline, you're gonna get you know 99% uptime or whatever, however many nines of uptime <laughs> and you <laughs> you lose track of it so fast. Is it three nines, <laughs> is it five nines? And you can, you know, you can build it out to get whatever level of redundancy and uptime that you need, but baseline, you're gonna get such better uptime and that's gonna reduce your, you know, and it's a lot cheaper than trying to do it yourself, trying to have multiple locations. You know, you can, like I said, you can build something in another Azure location and just have it turned off, like, and not charging you money, or you can build out uh, different ways of doing redundancy. That would cost you a lot more in, in a traditional on-prem. No, that's awesome. I think these calculator tools are are great uh, translators when you have to talk to the money people, right? When you got to talk to finance and CFOs, they it's like it's they just want it to work, right? But then when it comes to costs, now you really got their attention. So I think this is the bridge that those calculators are going to be the bridge that get you the the you know the money that you need to do your job efficiently. Cool. All right. We're are close to uh, halfway here. So let's jump in. We got, I know we've already been answering some of these questions. So you guys ready to get some of these, get, get some of these going. Uh, the first one is, is a good one right out of the gate. So, and I, there's a debate with this when you're recommending stuff for personal IT, you know, uh, consumer tech versus professional, how would you compare the Azure environment with the Google infrastructure when it comes to power cost? ease administration, et cetera. Like, and that's when you're always like, should I be, you know, should I get an iPhone or get an Android? And like, well, what is your ecosystem that you're used to? But now it's a little bit different, right? Cause now you're talking about professional costs. So do you guys want to touch on that? And that's from our buddy TK3. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take this one. Um, so I'm never going to talk down on any environment. I don't want to say bad things about Google or Azure, but 
at the end of the day, both of those are kind of built on the backbone of Microsoft, like especially uh, AWS. You know, a lot of times you're still doing licensing with Microsoft to get your exchange or to get this or that. And it just reduces that complexity of, you know, oh, I'm doing this in Google, but maybe Google doesn't have complete clarity with what I'm trying to achieve. So I have to use this third party tool. Um, so I, I feel like Microsoft just has a better scope. Um, and so that that's what I'd really just say is like, if you're evaluating any of these applications, make sure that, try to figure out what has the biggest polarity between what you're currently doing and what you're looking at doing. Um, because there's a lot of things that you know, these others can't achieve. And there's, I'm sure that there's plenty that they do better in different aspects, but just having it all simplified of like, you know, oh, I'm doing my mailboxes in Exchange. If I'm on AWS, I'm still paying for a Microsoft license thing. You know, I can, you know, just like insurance, I can group things together and save, right? Like, <laughs> uh, you know, there's, the um, you know, when, when you try to, when you bundle it, it does create a single point of failure. But when you have all of these different things working together, if one thing fails, you can still be sitting on your hands waiting for one service to come up, even if you have you know multiple things, right? So that's what that's why I would say about like looking at Google and AWS and Azure. Check all three of them out, but see what is going to give you a, the most holistic approach to you know actually doing your business needs. Yeah, I agree. And what your what your ecosystem currently looks like and how it dubs whatever dovetails in naturally. Because I think a lot of times this used to happen a lot with hardware. You you get this, you know, potpourri of different mixes and then you got a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I you you nailed it. The bundle and save insurance approach is the way to go. You know, there's a lot of heavy lifting to get to that point, you know, but mm -hmm. when you in the end you are gonna save money. Yeah, the needs right, of the business uh, kind of factor into that too. As exactly, far as the needs of international location and all, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that goes into saying, you know, what's one versus the other. So, right. Yeah, I don't think there's the the silver bullet, right? Of just like this is it, boom. It's going to be very subjective to what your business needs are. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next question from A L Media. Uh, can I use the Azure Remote Desktop solution with Azure VM servers, or only with Azure Virtual Desktop? So I'm not entirely sure what they're asking, to be perfectly honest, yeah. because they're all, you know, you're talking about Azure VM ser servers and Azure Virtual Desktop. So Azure Virtual Desktop um, is, you know, how they brand their VDI application, right? And that uses, they use a new remote desktop app to access it. So it, it's one of the things that I really dislike about Microsoft is they use very similar, if not the exact same terminology for several things. <laughs> and so <Yes>. they, <laughs> um, so I would, I would just say, look into some of the documentation for Azure virtual desktops. Cause I think that's going to handle uh, exactly what you're looking for. And it's, it's just a way to connect into virtual machines that are in Azure for your end users very similarly to terminal server uh for on-prem all right good stuff uh next question and coming in from chemco devops uh is there a good way to find resources that you are paying for in azure that you know that might be stale i didn't set up this azure environment but i have taken it over and there's a ton of stuff that not sure what it all needed and feel like we're paying for extras we are net needing. And that's, I guess that's the new issue of when you start a new job and you go and it used to be on-prem, the only way to find out if a server, what, who was using it and if it was in use is turn it off, right? <laughs> and see who, see who barks. Uh, that's a little bit more, you know, that was the rudimentary, but how do you, you know, how do you approach this when it comes to Azure resources? Um, it, I mean, coming into a new environment where you don't have any idea of what's there is always going to be difficult, especially if you're getting questions, or at least if you're asking yourself, you know, what am I paying for? And you're, you know, if you're in the situation where what's stale, what's being used and what's not, I mean, Azure 
correct me if I'm wrong, Blake, but that's where you can kind of get the most benefit out of the Azure Calc cost analysis tool to kind of see, you know, what are you using, how much are you using, and what, you know, what is it costing you, and from there, kind of make the deduction on whether or not it's it's active or inactive. I would also say check out uh, the uh, monitoring and logging and see, you know, what is anyone. You can usually see like if anyone's logging into a server or uh, if anyone is like accessing these things and see, you know, what are the the logs for it. So it's it's really something that you're going to have to comb through and be very. Uh, methodical about because if you don't have those the monitoring and the logging and the alerts turned on you'll have to kind of turn it on for things and then see what is actually being used um, but there there's a lot of things that you can look at um, the, the, in Azure there's logs for everything you just have to enable them and do some dig deep and you don't want to be new guy turned off my server like i i do understand nobody, nobody wants that. <laughs> hey hey i'll be that guy because you can answer real quick <laughs> you do you really <laughs> just leave yourself in a nice escape route when you flip something off that you can turn it right back on but that's the best way to find out if someone's using something especially you can screenshot and like hey does anyone recognize this and usually it's crickets but when you do a call to action like this is off now and those just like oh maybe they didn't even know they were using it <laughs> so that's always a fun experiment <laughs> all right uh, uh next question uh, Kunkabo, do i have to have any on-prem ad servers when using azure ad in the cloud i would prefer to be 100 percent in the cloud um, so uh, there's two approaches to this. Uh, you could either virtualize your uh, AD server, and so you have a, a virtual machine running in Azure that's running Active Directory, um, or they have uh, Azure Directory Domain Directory Services, AADDS, which is a mouthful, uh, that handles a lot of the similar um, AD functions. Uh, I would You would have to kind of look at what your active directory is doing because some of the things aren't quite fully uh, fleshed out as far as uh, the azure aadds um, you know like group policies you can't really push them yet unless if you're also like using intune um, so you can get polarity without having a traditional ad server but my general rule my, my general philosophy would be probably virtualize it, put it in a machine in Azure first, and then just to get, to get off of, you know, if you're trying to get out of having physical devices, um, I've been at companies where the AD server is a computer under a desk. <laughs> and so yeah. get, get away from that, virtualize it, put it in the cloud, and then evaluate what are we doing with AD and can this be handled by Azure Active Directory domain services. If it can't, you can keep it virtualized. If it can, you can remove it. Um, there's so th those are the two things that I would really suggest doing if you have an on-prem AD. It's interesting. I was thinking about that. So we're talking about Azure in 2022, startups in 2022. Did we eliminate AD servers running next to mop buckets and janitor closets? Like, are those days over? Like, do, I are, think it from, just I think for most company, or not most, but like a lot of companies, you can do a completely cloud environment and not have like a traditional Active Directory server. Um, you know, my last my last company, we didn't have one. It was great. I loved it. It was so nice not having to like replicate <laughs> back and like try to, you know, everything was just in the Office 365 portal and the Azure portal, and that was all of our management. It was beautiful. Um, you know, a lot of the complication comes from having traditional approaches and then having to, okay, how do I cut this back without breaking something, right? That, that's that's right. always the biggest thing is how do I how do I move to the next generation without having all of this legacy stuff that's kind of holding me back. Um, so yeah. if you are a new company, a startup, um, I, I think for a lot of new startup companies, they can get away with not having any of that traditional hardware computer. and infrastructure, you know, you can, you can get rid of a VPN, you can get rid of 
a lot of different things just depending on what your workload is. But if you're, you know, there are some things that you can't get rid of if depending on your workload, you know, like if, if you're running terabytes of data, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to throw everything into one drive and have it all work perfectly, right? Like there, right. there are still some limitations, but for, you know, anything that's like, you know, a small 10, 15 man shop, I think you can probably get away with just having, you know, either Office 365 or like Office 365 and Azure. So uh, I, yeah, I really hope that we're getting rid of all of the mop bucket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, all the new startups have no tech debt, but like, you know, any kind of tech debt, like Alex uh, Fisher and Chad so, still have a server stack that's inside the kitchenette. Those were always fun stories. Like I went to a client and you're not going to believe where they were running their most important business critical server. <laughs> Yeah. So, all right, good stuff. All right, uh, next question is from JPP. What would you say is the possibility to migrate to Azure from an on-prem AD and retain our custom password policy enforcer software? You can, you can definitely, uh, you can definitely do that. Uh, I would be curious to know, like, what's so specific about the custom password policy enforcer that he's worried about migrating it. Um, but I mean, you either, yeah, you'd either be able to, to migrate it, you know, into its own VM and have it run as is like no problem. Um, or you could just end up using, uh, Azure for your password policy. I'm assuming you don't want to do that because you're asking the question, but yeah, if, uh, the password policy enforcer is a piece of software that runs on a VM, then you would just migrate it with everything else. Yeah, I know there's always the, if, if, if it's working, you always get a little leery about like really shifting how it is, but you're right. Just make it part of the, part of the, the whole move, the move as a whole. If, if you're right. already thinking about moving, think about whether or not you need it. You know, you're paying extra for this. It's something that can be done in Azure natively, um, you know, and I've, I've had some really weird password enforcement policies and uh, there's been a lot of uh, change to how people are viewing passwords. A lot of time they don't actually want people to change passwords anymore. They want you to make a secure password and people are going to hate me for it. But like if you make a good password once, you don't need to change it as often. Um, because what ends up happening is if you are enforcing crazy password uh, requirements, you're going to start seeing a lot of sticky notes on the desk. Yeah. So I, I would good say point. look at look at trying to handle it exclusively in Azure, turn on MFA, turn on conditional access uh, to really lock it down. There, there are better ways to approach it that are a lot more technologically advanced that are gonna give you a better result. So he just posted in the chat, but he said it adds a layer of control that Microsoft currently does not offer, but he mentioned that it does already exist on his domain controller running Windows Server. So I would assume that that would be able to migrate very, very, very simply. Yeah, it virtualized should machine. You from doing it, so. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Next question from Mullen. Should we keep our services as VMs or is it better to migrate to SaaS where available like SQL databases or IIS sites? Is there cost savings benefits to SaaS over a VM? Um, it's hard to say without knowing exactly your infrastructure. What I would do is I would I would kind of chunk it up and say, okay, you know, look at each service individually, look at what Azure has to offer and just, you know, do it by a case by case basis. Uh, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and you shouldn't migrate your information, all of your data in a day either. So just piece it out and look at each uh, thing specific because there, there are some constraints on uh, Azure applications. So, you know, test it out or talk to us and we will, you know, go through and evaluate and see if, you know, what is the actual best solution. It's it's hard to give a blanket statement for, should we virtualize this? My answer is most of the time going to be yes, but, you know, there are, there are use cases of keeping it in what's working, right? Yes, asterisk. I think is the way, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, asterisk. Yes, asterisk. <laughs> cool. All right, I, I think we kind of hit on this, but we'll drive it home again with Chemco DevOps. Uh, what's the best way to review all Azure costs? I know we were talking about the uh, the TCO calculator and the pricing out calculators. 
Is there any kind of reports or anything we want to hit on that maybe that's in Azure as well? Um, I mean, it also depends too. Like, if as far as review all Azure costs, like if he's talking about you know trying to get a, a total prediction of what it's going to cost him before he moves, then there's tools for that. And then you know, and those tools are in the links. <laughs> yeah, yes, we do have they are in our widgets. Included. And then there's also the idea, you know, like if we're already in Azure and we plan on growing, like how do we predict um, the scale at which we're going to grow and what that's going to cost and compare it to on-prem. And that's one of those things where you just kind of have to do due diligence or work with a, you know, a CSP like ourselves and, and just give us as accurate information as possible. Because I would say one of the most um, difficult things when you're dealing with uh, a new customer moving to the cloud is you try to explain to them to give us as much detail as possible. We'd rather have more than less. That way we can give them the most accurate information because they they want to know what it's going to cost, what their infrastructure is going to look like and you know how reliable it's going to be. And we want to provide that to them and it really comes down to them giving us information that allows us to make those decisions and present them with the data so that you know when they do finally say yes or no, we're going to do it, they have confidence behind that decision. Yeah, and if you're already in Azure, there are reports. I know we give a lot of our clients, we can do like a breakdown report for their Azure spend and, you know, licensing, you know, Microsoft is data. There's always data available if you're in, in it. Cool. All right, this might be an opportunity for another yes, no, or yes, asterisk <laughs> to answer. Uh, can you use Azure Site Recover to move an on-prem solution to Azure permanently? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can, do, well, I would say, yes, you can, um, you know, you can set, have it, you know, replicate over and then you can set that as the primary, you know, there's a lot of different use cases of doing that, but m me being me, my first thought is instead of taking what you have set up somewhere else and just replicating it to a new environment. I think I'd rather build it in the new environment and have what I build fresh be a mirror to what's existing because then I know that I'm not pulling a bunch of legacy stuff with it. You know, you know, if if I'm building like a you know, it's kind of it's kind of like if I get a new computer should i pull the hard drive out of my old one and plug it into my new one you can do that but you know sometimes just running a fresh os is you know a better approach that that's kind yeah. of what i would say okay cool makes sense uh i like this next question I, and it's going to kind of be kind of reiterate everything we're talking about and it'll be good because it'll give us a chance to refresh that so this is coming from damon so where in the heck do you even start looking at it if you are a total on-prem company what is the best reason to devote the time into it if it ain't broke why so we're talking about like if you're now we're talking about the other side of that tech that you're already all on prem right and it's working so what is what is the compelling reason to to make that jump to something like azure besides you know like we well this will be i'm gonna let you guys talk because it's everything we just talked about <laughs> yeah so my my first thought is is it really working? Because there's the difference between it working and you putting up with it working. <laughs> and so I would say if it's not working, you might not need, if it is working, you might not need to move it. But I would really look at what are your current pain points and what does the future growth of your company look like? Because if your infrastructure might be working for now, but is it going to work in a year? Um, and you might not have the flexibility to say, okay, what I have now is not gonna work within a year. And what you might want to do is you might want to, okay, I'm gonna keep my current infrastructure, but everything that I build new, I'm gonna build in the cloud. And so you're just slowly phasing out the old stuff and replacing it with new stuff. Uh, we also mentioned the total cost of ownership calculator. You can put in all of your compute resources and stuff and get that price breakdown of what does it look like if I'm going to replace it with new on-prem stuff versus what does the cost look like if I'm moving to Azure? So that would be kind of the, the first step is I would look at that tool and input in all of what I have and figure out, okay, you know, because 
all all hardware degrades, you're going to have to replace it all someday, whether that someday is today or five years down the road. Um, you know, in five years, you know, I, who knows if on-prem is still even a viable option. I think it will always be a viable option, but, you know, I think trying to get ahead of problems is going to be your best use case. You know, no one could have predicted uh, the pandemic and having everyone work from home, but the people who are already in the cloud had the best success of transitioning, right? So that would be kind of my argument is it might be working. It might be working great. If it's working great, you might not want to touch it. But as you are finding things that are new problems and challenges, building out the new solutions to that in the cloud is probably going to be your best answer. Chad, Chad you want to add anything done? to that? <laughs> I, mean, I think that covers it. Like the, the biggest part is like if it's not broke, like why look towards it? And, you know, the reality is like uh, there is there's cases for you to stay on prem and there's cases for you to move to the cloud. Um, but being able to keep the benefits in the cloud um, that you don't have on prem, like reliability, uptime, you know, integrity, those are usually some of the biggest factors that would allow you to want to move or at least to start positioning yourself to when you, you know, like Blake said, everything that you build out new will go towards the cloud as all your old stuff fails, or, you know, or just becomes end of life. Uh, that's probably the, the biggest, you know, motivational push. Um, and then, you know, also there's like, there's free trials in Azure. Like, uh, you know, you can have a certain amount of spend to play with. So you could always go in there, uh, you know, find a specific service that, you know, is not insanely costly and just see like, you know, is it easier for you to manage Azure? Um, and, you know, as you got more resources in there, would it be easier for your whole company to, to function? Is it quicker to manage, easier to manage? Uh, is your decision-making process a lot less cumbersome because you're in the cloud? Uh, you know, those kind of factors play into it. Yeah, and if I may, I'm gonna just add my my two cents here too, and um, our IT friends out there may throw tomatoes at me for this, but you know, when you're factoring in like good BCP plans, you have to get input from other departments, right? And Blake, like what you were talking about earlier, Where's the business going in five years? Where's your business going? What's the plan and that? And you have to be ready to scale, right? So even if it's working perfectly, 100% on-prem, but you might not be in the know on what the sales is built, what sales is building with something. Where Mark, you know, I think having them factor then is like, okay, it's working as the business is right now, but I have to be ready to go in five years because this department is planning you know, a different type of rollout or a different type of solution. I think a lot of these managers are a lot more savvy. You know, they're reading, they're on, they're on the net, they're reading trades too. And they're saying, you know, well, what about this? Like, how is this an option for this? So I think it gets to the point eventually that you do have to start opening up the doors a little bit and letting some people have a little bit of input. Yeah. And I think if they're already, you know, if you're already watching this, you're already, you know, doing your due diligence about being on top of things and like staying ahead of the technology, right? And right. whether, even if your company's technology is currently slowly aging as an on-prem does, you know, as long as you yourself and your whole IT team really is like having that future thought, you know, you're, you're, you're gonna set yourself up for success. You know, I can't tell you whether or not you should migrate from, you know, on-prem to cloud without seeing your environment and talking to like some of your end users and, you know, getting a feel for what the company is. But if you're here listening to this, you're probably on the right track. Exactly, great point. All right, we still got about seven minutes. So we got some more questions if you guys want to keep going. Uh, uh, so we have- I'm loving it, keep going. Yeah, this is good stuff. So rather 2385, are there price breaks for fall businesses or is this a one size fits all model? Um, so as far as that goes, there's, there's not really a price break for a small business. There's ways you can, you know, leverage ways to, to save money, but it's not business size dependent per se. Um, cause at the end of the day, Azure's consumption based, right? So it's, it's what you use and what you consume. That's where you're going to get charged for. So hopefully, I, I don't know if Blake has any more to add to that. Maybe he knows something I don't know, but. There's not really any price breaks for small businesses. Um, what I would suggest is 
you know, looking at where you kind of can save. Um, if you are buying your licensing for Office 365 directly from Microsoft, come talk to us at Trusted Tech Team because we can probably give you a discount on your uh, Office licensing. Um, and then I think we also provide uh, price breaks for some Azure stuff as well. Uh, I'm not much of a pricing guy. I build things. <laughs> uh, I, I send over to other people to price, but I know that for at least our Office 365 licensing, we our price is probably going to beat most of the competitors. So, and what Chad said, where it's all consumption based. So if you're a small company and you're not consuming as much, um, you know that's kind of your price break. Uh, they don't offer different pricing to your based on user counts, unfortunately. But uh, I'm going to give you guys a plug and hit it right what you just said. I mean, the price break is going to trust the tech team because if you're a small staff, you might not know exactly what you need to do, right? Or if you're a new startup, you don't have a lot of people and you're going into Azure for the first time, it could be very overwhelming. So the price break is getting people from trusted tech team to actually help build you out and show you all the tricks, right? You wouldn't go to a gym and kind of wander around, you hire a personal trainer, you used to go to you know travel agents. Again, the mover analogy is just like, I can do it myself, but should I do it myself? So having the experts you know, looking at it for you, I think is where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. All right, uh, a couple more, so we have, uh, Let's see. Oh, Nick Singh, uh, can you discuss about your ProDirect support? I'm not sure. Um, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure, but uh, if you're a client with us, you automatically get a higher tier of support, uh, and you're going to hit our uh, our support team before Azure or not Azure, but before like Microsoft support, and so we actually have. Uh, you know, a much higher support tier than like a normal person going directly to Microsoft. So you're going to get better support. And uh, I, I heard somewhere in the office, and I don't know if this is true. So uh, knock on wood, and, you know, I'm going to get yelled at for saying this. But I think, <laughs> you know, what if you wanted the same support from Microsoft directly that we get and provide to our clients directly, it would cost you a thousand dollars a month, um, and that's just an innate feature that we give you to bypass that tier one and that tier two support with my, whenever we have to escalate an issue to Microsoft. So I think that's what he's talking about, about our pro direct support is first, you're going to get people at trusted tech team, and we're going to try and troubleshoot your support with greater care than Microsoft. And if we can't answer it and we need to escalate to Microsoft, we bypass the first two tiers of Microsoft support and get engineers who can actually assist you. Awesome. All right, we got time for one more before I give you guys the floor for some final thoughts uh, from our friend T. Roberts too. Are there any best practices for security with SQL on Azure versus being on-prem and being mostly restricted by LAN access? I mean, if you have an air-gap SQL server, <laughs> it's pretty secure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like as far as if there's best practices with SQL on Azure, I mean, yes. Um, but comparing it to on-prem, it's kind of difficult to to relate the two. There's always gonna there's a best practices set up for something that's in the cloud. Um, you know, zero trust, uh, role-based access controls. That that's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, versus on-prem, on-prem kind of I want to say follows the same guide, but the fact that your database is potentially a lot more limited on LAN uh, to its exposure. Um, you know, to the internet, to the World Wide Web versus in the cloud is a little different. So I'm not sure how deep you want to go into it, Blake, but. I'm, I'll just do two little notes is, uh, you know, you can also limit your, you know, any access network in Azure. So you can have that your SQL server can only talk to, you know, your VPN and not talk to any other of the things that you have in Azure. Or if you like wanted to limit it similarly, what you might want to do is you might want to build uh, Azure Virtual Desktop. So you have your people remoting into the desktop, and then the, the desktop can communicate with your SQL server, and your SQL server can't communicate with anything else in Azure. And that's kind of how you would have that polarity on the cloud, is you know your people would sign into the desktop and 
the desktop can talk to your SQL server. And then you're going to have all of the other uh, ways of, you know, authenticating, you know, your password, your uh, MFA, your conditional access, any other security policies that you have in place for users getting into uh, Azure to begin with uh, is going to help lock down. But yeah, it's, it's hard to say that, you know, it, it's hard to compare being on, you know, a locking down access to a LAN uh, to being in the cloud. It, it's a hard polarity, but there's a lot of things that you can do to lock down your SQL Server or any service in Azure, so other things can't get through it. Um, but, you know, there, there's ways to get around security on a LAN network as well, you know, that it's just yeah. different vectors, right? Exactly. Awesome. Well, guys, that was an awesome conversation. Great questions. Thank you for keeping going. Blake, while you have the conch on as you finish this off, I know there's a few more items we want to hit before we wrap up and announce our winners. Yeah, of course. Um, so if anyone is interested in learning more, whether it be Office 365 pricing, which we touched on a little bit, uh, you know, Azure, uh, what we can do, you know, what Azure can do, what you're currently running on-prem, you know, any anything at all, please reach out to us. There's a link in the sidebar and that will uh, help you book a consultation with one of our licensed experts. You'll select the uh, unlock M365 savings button and they will either direct you to a licensing person or to our professional services team if you're looking to have something built out. Um, you know, after, in that call, the licensing engineer will be able to assist you in reducing the cost of your M365 licenses and can even get you set up with uh, discounted Azure offerings. Good stuff, man. And hey, let's keep the conversation going in the community. Hit up Triple T team. There's resources in the widgets for you. Uh, but uh, thank you all for joining us today. Our winners of our two e-gift cards are Squirrel Biscuits and Smith9558. Congratulations. Uh, you'll be contacted on that. But Again, Blake, Chad, thank you so much. This is always very enlightening. I love moderating and learning at the same time. It was really good. So now we know it's time for tacos, naps, <laughs> or next meeting. <laughs> that sounds good. Taco so Tuesday. thank you, guys. Oh, yes, yes, let's yes. do it. All right. Thank you thank all you for joining much. us. Right. Yes, we'll guys. see you next time. Don't forget to tech yourself before you wreck yourself. We'll see you next time. <laughs>